Before we start off with this video, I want to make a few things very, very clear. Just as with my Clear Sky tutorial video, this is going to be a guide for a decent four-man squad. I'm sure that when matchmaking is involved and when you're playing with a bunch of potatoes, other strategies might be more of use to you. Uh, this video is by no means the only way to do stolen signal, but if your team is experienced enough, uh, then doing it the way that I'm going to show you in this video is surely going to be the easiest and also going to be the fastest way of doing it. Also, yeah, this video is way overdue. Why am I making a tutorial on this right now and not when it came out, like what, seven or eight months ago? Well, that is because a lot of people still seem to be struggling with this mission to this day and because the incursion that players will have to complete come the next global event, it is going to be Stolen Signal, this incursion. But yeah, with all of that stuff out of the way though, let's start with the guide. More than with any other mission in the game, having the right builds is going to be quite important with Stolen Signal. Sure, it can be done with any Frankenstein pile of shit builds you can scrape together. But if you can output enough DPS at the right times, you can actually skip big parts of the mission and some of its mechanics by bursting down each of the four bosses before the game is able to react. This guide is still going to cover everything, even what happens if you fail to meet that DPS threshold, because even my squad isn't able to do this 100% of the time. But having all the damage is going to be critical to clearing this mission fast. And that is also why I'm going to recommend that 3 out of the 4 players run with a PvE optimized damage build. You could run Striker, Lone Star, Sentry, whatever one it is that you like to pick, go with it. And just get a whole bunch of enemy armor damage and damage to elites stacked with it. Even some purple mods as I showed in my PvE Sentry build. And then, as you probably guessed it, the last guy he's going to have to run with a PvE Reclaimer build. And I also have a video for that that I posted a few weeks back. Of course, you don't have to have these builds. You can also go with a Tactician PvP healer. I'm not saying that that's not going to work. It's actually what I used to do before the Classified Reclaimer came out. These are just my recommendations. The Classified Reclaimer, the Striker, the Sentry, the Lone Star builds, they're going to make your life easier. All of this is to make your life easier. Despite popular belief, though, you don't actually need any dedicated shield play. Player. Not even for the last room, because at the end, the Reclaimer user can temporarily swap out the station for a shield, and then the damage guys can simply swap to a shield and that will be strong enough. But we'll get there when we get there. That's all the way at the end of the video, so let's save that for at the end of the video. Surely, if one of the DPS players can swap to a high skill power build when you get there, or when you have somebody that has a dedicated shield build ready for when you get to that last part, it's going to help out. But again, it's not necessary. The last thing that I want to recommend you guys is that every player in the squad should be running with a weapon that has Determined unlocked on it. Uh, Determined is a weapon talent that gives you 7.5% of your signature skill back after getting a kill, which is very, very helpful. And if everybody is running this, you can basically always pop a signature skill. This could be a tech link, a recovery link, or a survivor link. It doesn't matter. You'll have it ready for every boss encounter. Oh, and also one more thing. Um, make sure that everybody is running with some sort of sniper weapon as their secondary weapon. If all goes to plan and you execute everything perfectly, then you never really have to use the sniper. But if you for some reason fail at doing the skips, you can't get it to work. Uh, if there's some other reason why you can't burst down the bosses, then in some situations these bosses are going to be in positions where they're very hard to hit if you don't have a sniper. So just make sure you have one as your secondary weapon or at least something that you have on you from your inventory. But that's that. That's the builds. Uh, so, stolen signal. Let's get to it. Now, I don't think that anybody has a lot of trouble getting through the first few mobs and getting to the actual building. So skipping forward past a few couple of NPCs that you have to kill. We are here in this building and we have to choose to go into any of the three rooms. You see three doors, two on the bottom and then one on the top. And each of these doors leads to a room where you will have to kill a boss. All of these bosses have to be killed, so you can't just pick one and then go with that. But you can do them in any order that you like. It is for this reason that I've got some timestamps here that you can skip to, to particular parts in the video. They're also in the description box down below, by the way. So if you're having trouble with any particular boss, then you can just skip to that part of the video. Right now, though, we're going to start off with the door on the bottom right, the one that leads to the boss named as Checkers. Now, a lot of people, again, assume that you need a shield for this first part uh, in the hallway leading up to Checkers. You know, because there's a turret there and you need to block the damage. You need to protect the carrier of the box. And although sure, having a shield here, it's not going to hurt you, but it isn't necessary. Instead of blocking all the damage with a shield, you can also just drop an EMP grenade or an EMP sticky on the turrets. And then those turrets will be temporarily disabled and thus they're not going to do any damage. In addition to that, you can also have the whole team run in front of you and run around the player that is carrying the box. 
And then everybody just uses their first aid and heals up and uses triage to get all the cooldowns back up. You know how it works, pretty much like the dance that you do in PvP. But now you do it in PvE, in this hallway, to heal everybody up and make sure nobody dies to the turrets. Uh, we usually also pop a survivor link and a recovery link just to be safe, just to make sure that nobody is going down. And of course we also use medkits when needed to combat medic each other, because the last thing that you want to do is have the box carrier pop a medkit, which then makes him drop the box and slow the whole thing down as a result of it. Also, make sure to keep an eye out on the shotgunners and the grenadier NPCs that spawn when the box carrier enters the last corridor. Not that these NPCs are so lethal, they don't really do a lot of damage, but they could stagger the box carrier, uh, which then makes him drop the box as well. Uh, it's important that the box carrier just keeps moving and moving and moving, you don't want to be stuck picking up the box. Otherwise the turrets could come back online and start to do more damage, and then you go down, you have to pick up the box again, and it just becomes a mess. So, long story short, run in circles in front and around the carrier, heal him up, and EMP some of the turrets when you're able to. As soon as the box is in the bigger box, I'm not sure what to call it, uh, the doors to the boss room will open and you can start the boss fight. At first, the boss will not be here though, you're going to have to kill some NPCs, a couple of heavies, a couple of shotgunners, a couple of grenadiers. But with a reclaimer healing station in the middle of the room and with three damage dealers, this really shouldn't be an issue. If you're already running into issues here where you can't kill the NPCs and they're killing you, it's time for a gear check. It means that you're either very much under geared or that one or more players in the squad is simply underperforming. That's also possible. You could bring the right gear, but then they're not landing their shots. When you're in this room, uh, once every while a shotgunner also spawn that has this marker above his head, this timer. Uh, and this shotgunner is coded to attack the JTF officer hiding underneath the desk in the middle of the room. When he spawns, make sure to kill him first, because if that timer above his head runs out, he will, well, as you probably guessed it, kill the JTF and that causes you to wipe. He is very squishy though, so it's very easy to just burst him down, but if you forget about him, that's gonna be a problem. After you've had a couple of small waves of these shotgunners and heavies and grenadiers, the sniper boss will finally spawn on the balcony, either on the right or the left side, it's completely random. But the moment that she spawns in, someone of the group needs to activate a tech link and all four players of the squad should be getting close to the boss and bursting the boss down. It is possible that when you activate the tech link and when everybody starts shooting, the boss will duck down to heights. If this happens, everybody needs to simply stop shooting, be patient, and wait for the boss to duck back up. That's your best shot at killing the boss. Because if you keep shooting and shooting and shooting, the boss will stay hidden and you won't be able to kill her. One of the damage dealers could also equip a sticky flashbang or a sticky EMP that he can shoot up if the boss happens to be hiding for a very long time and if you want to avoid that. But if you do it correctly, the moment the boss pops up, well, he's gonna die because of all the damage. And then this part of the mission should be done. Just like that. That is, that is checkers. That's the whole room finished. If you aren't able to burst her down though, because maybe some of your teammates missed the queue or weren't paying attention or were doing something else, I don't know. Uh, a lot of NPCs will begin to spawn in the room and they will keep spawning until you finally kill the boss. Which then makes this whole part of the mission more hectic and chaotic. So I would really recommend just trying to avoid that. It's still possible to finish the room afterwards, it just becomes a bit harder. You're gonna have to pop survivor link to survive all the damage and then deal with the boss. Why make it more difficult than it needs to be? Be ready when the boss spawns in, pop a tech link, burst her down. There is a clear indication on the screen when the boss is going to spawn in. After that indication, you even have a couple of seconds to get in position. Make sure the whole team is ready for that and then tech link when it happens. The second room we're going to enter is the one that leads to Curveball. That's, that's his name. That's the boss's name, Curveball. And this is arguably the trickiest one of the three rooms we're going to cover. This is because of two things. One, you need to have quite some timing if you want to burst down the boss fast. And two, the shock effects that the players get from walking on the wet floor get more frequent and also more deadly as the boss gets the lower and lower health. So if you cannot burst down the boss fast enough, because it's pretty tricky to do so, this room too gets quite hectic really, really fast. But before we get to the actual boss room, you will have to go through this hallway and kill a few more Rikers. This part, honestly, I'm just going to say this, it's pretty easy. Uh, the only thing that the healer has to keep in mind is that the moment that you've cleared everything and the moment that you're going to enter the actual boss room, you're going to have to have your support station ready. Because as soon as you enter the room, the Reclaimer user is going to have to put his station down on the floor to prevent the team from getting stunned. You have a little bit of time, but not much, so just make sure you have it ready. 
Also, you don't just want to put your support station anywhere. No, 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 no. You want to place it on one of these white parts or one of these elevated parts of the floor because those parts of the floor are not wet and thus they're not going to be affected by the electric shock effect that I just talked about. It is true that in the support station you have immunity. So as long as the support station is up, you know, the players are not going to get shocked. But the shockwave also deals damage, and the damage is going to kill the support station. And thus, when the station gets destroyed, then the shockwave is also going to damage the players, and that could cause a very easy wipe. Very unexpected sometimes as well. If you have a Reclaimer, of course, you don't have to worry about it too much, because if the station gets killed, it instantly goes off cooldown again. But even as a healer, you want to be helping out to kill the boss because you only have a few seconds to do so. If you then, during those crucial few seconds, have to replace the station, yeah, it, it could be the difference between killing the boss or not killing the boss. So, how are we going to go about killing this boss? Well, just as with Checkers, the previous boss that we talked about, he is not in the room from the very start. You're gonna have to kill some NPCs first. First, these normal NPCs. After you kill that, a heavy spawns in that walks up to the middle. Oh, and by the way, guys, uh, this is a thing that heavies do in this room. After you kill a heavy, another heavy will spawn, and after you kill him, another heavy will spawn, and so on and on and on. And each of these heavies, they will walk to the middle of the catwalk, trying to kill the JTF officer that's hanging from this rope from the ceiling. Um, if he stays there too long, JTF is gonna die, and you're gonna wipe, same as the previous room. So just keep an eye out for those heavies. But anyway, after you kill the first NPCs in this room, the first heavy is going to spawn in. And after you kill that heavy, a few more NPCs are gonna spawn in. And here's the thing. Once you kill the first NPC that spawns after the first heavy is dead, so basically the NPC that you kill after the heavy, that is the moment that Curveball will spawn. And he will spawn under this staircase and then try to walk up to the top of this staircase thing. What many people do in this room is that they simply wait until Curveball spawns and then walks up to the staircase. And then once he's there, on the top, all safe and sound, only then the players start bringing out their sniper and trying to snipe this guy down. And while it is not a bad thing to do that, it's a bit slow. I mean, this guy is quite hard to hit when he's up there. He hides a lot and then all the NPCs keep spawning in. It makes the room pretty difficult in my opinion. But there is a way to speed things up and make it a whole lot easier. After you kill the heavy and then kill the NPC that makes Curveball spawn, two of the squad members will have to throw a fire grenade next to the staircase. One player throws it at the right side and then the other player throws it at the left side on these positions. And then when the boss spawns in, he will spawn inside of your fire grenade or spawn next to it and then run inside the fire grenade because he's coded to walk up the staircase. Because it's on fire, it's going to stop Curveball from moving up the staircase. And then once he stops moving and he's, you know, putting out the fire, he's stuck in the animation, someone else has to throw a shock grenade under him so that after the on fire effect, Curveball is still locked in the stun animation for another three to five seconds. Once you see that he's locked in the fire or in the stun animation, Another player, not the one that throws the grenade, but another player has to use the tech link and as you probably guessed it, all four players of the squad have to then just aim at the boss and try to burst him down. Again, it's a bit tricky because if you're late with the fire grenade, then he's just gonna run straight up and you're probably also not gonna hit the shock grenade. And you don't really get a second chance because, well, you only have a few fire grenades with you and you can't restock on them, so if you miss this opportunity, uh, you're going to have to kill him the normal way. Now, what is the normal way? Well, it's very simple. It's putting the support station down where I just said, uh, holding off the NPCs to make sure that they don't kill the JTF soldier, and then sniping down the boss whenever you have the opportunity. Now, my tip that I have for you is to have one player switch to a sentry build and snipe down the boss from below. Because without a dedicated sniper like sentry, it's going to be really hard to kill him once he's up there. So if you try this a couple times and you can't get it right, you can't pull it off to lock him into that position, uh, get somebody to change the sentry before you enter this room, because that's the only way that you're really going to kill him. But anyway, after you kill him, one way or another, you go through this door, you walk up, you get your loot, go back to the main room, and then it's time to do the last room on the list, the room to the boss named as Pickstick. And in my opinion, this is the easiest of all three of them. Uh, before you get to the actual room though, just as with the other two rooms, you will have to fight off uh, a few NPCs in the hallway. This hallway can be pretty tricky because there will be two waves, both shotgun waves with a couple of heavies, and they will just come rushing right at you. Um, here again, you could just use a fire, a stun, or a normal frag grenade to stagger them, put them on fire, CC them. A flashbang sticky of course also works, or a gas mine, whatever you want to go with. Any area of effect crowd control helps to keep these enemies in place. 
and when they're in place they should be pretty easy to burst down. Once you kill them you get to the boss room just as with the other two bosses and you want to rush over to the explosive detonation and have one guy defuse it while the rest just kills the mobs that are around him. Once all the mobs are clear uh, you can take a breather, you can take a moment for yourself because you're not fighting against the clock. Instead, you will be tasked to uh, free up the JTF officer that's stuck in this, this small room over here. The moment the player tries to do this, that's the moment when the boss will spawn in. So, as opposed to the other bosses in the mission, you actually have time to prepare, get in position, use the consumables, whatever, in anticipation to burst the boss down. So that's what we do. We have the damage player rush up to where the boss is going to spawn, and then have the healer open the door when they're all ready. Uh, the boss is always going to spawn in this top area among with a few other mobs and as soon as he does one player is going to have to shoot up an EMP sticky in his general direction into this room. Uh, this EMP sticky in itself will do nothing to the boss but what it will do is that it will cause a fire extinguisher in that room to explode. And that fire extinguisher is then going to disorient the boss and lock him into position which then allows the team to, yeah probably guessed it, pop a tech link and burst that guy down. What you could also do is just use grenades to lock him in place, but over time I found that the EMP is more reliable as it's not only easier to land, but it's also faster. The grenade was uh, a little bit iffy at times, and if you can't CC him with that disorient, then you're never going to be able to burst him down. Anyway, if you were able to do enough damage though, you will get a notification on the screen that says prepare for Pick Stick's final attack. Uh, and in this case, he's basically just gonna come down, rushing out of the door, usually with only a very small amount of health remaining. And when he, uh, he comes out, you can just finish him off with no effort. If, however, you were not able to do enough damage the moment that you tech linked, I mean, it happens a lot. He's behind a lot of cover, and if he ducks down, well, you can pretty much forget it. But if you weren't able to do it, the boss will use some of the upper stadium walkways to get to the other side of the room, and he's gonna try to shoot you from there. When he goes there, he is pretty difficult to hit because, again, there's a lot of cover around him. But don't worry, because there's one more chance to deal massive amounts of damage to him before he becomes really annoying to kill. When he starts running to the other side of the room, you have to wait for him right at this position and then aim at this fire extinguisher. Now, the moment he walks by, you have to shoot it, and then this thing will put a disorient status effect on pick stick and then that will prevent him from walking forward for a few seconds or run back to the other side of the room where he's easier to hit. If the first stack link did not allow you to deal enough damage, then catching him here will most certainly do the trick. Otherwise, tell your DPS players to wake up because they're not doing enough damage. Anyway, after you do enough damage, after the armor is all gone, he will come rushing down. This time he will go through another door, but the process will be the same as before. Just wait for him to come out and then kill him and that's this room for that when all is done and when you've finished all the three rooms it is time for the final stage and i think that this is where most people go wrong and mess up because yes there are quite some things that can go wrong and quite some things that can mess up but on the flip side there are also a lot of ways that you can shave off a lot of time per run if your group is experienced enough and if they know what they're doing we'll get to all of that in a second first up let's talk a little bit about the builds if any of the high damage players is able to swap to a shield build or swap to a healer build that can temporarily replace a support station with a shield, then this would be the time to do it. However, if you can't do it, again, no problem. Things are just going to be a little bit more difficult because there's going to be some more timing related things, but you'll see that soon enough. Now, in this last room, uh, the players are required to defend captured JTF soldiers from a giant minigun. This minigun will only target the JTF soldiers at very specific times. And when it does, the players have to physically block the bullets from hitting the JTF soldier with the shield skill. So they basically have to stand in between the JTF soldier and the turret and then block all of the damage. The game will very clearly tell you when the turret is going to attack a JTF soldier and which JTF soldier that is going to be. At any time that the game is not specifically telling you to defend a specific JTF soldier, you don't have to worry about them. The turret will not shoot them and the JTF soldiers cannot die. Even if the turret or some other NPC hits it by accident because he was trying to shoot at you but then the JTF soldier got in the way, uh, even in those cases the JTF soldiers aren't gonna die. They're literally invincible. So the long story short here, don't worry about the JTF. Worry about yourself not getting hit unless the game tells you to specifically defend a JTF soldier. That's the very basic rule of this whole room. So. How we're gonna clear it? Well, when you first enter this room, there will just be a couple of NPCs that you have to take out. Maybe two, three or four more will spawn, but they're nothing special. They should be pretty easy to take down. The real threat 
of this room is the minigun, because it's gonna shoot at you when it has line of sight. So while you don't really have to be afraid of the NPCs, you kinda wanna be taking cover from that minigun or else you will get bursted down. Now after you take out the first couple of NPCs in this room, that's the moment when the game's gonna tell you to defend the first JTF officer. It could be any of the three, it's kinda random which one the game picks. Uh, you have this guy in the front, then you have this guy in the middle, and you have this guy in the back. And it's totally possible that with one run the game decides that you have to defend the one in the front, and then the next time that you play the mission you're going to have to defend the guy in the middle, or the guy in the back. Again, it's random. When defending the JTF soldiers with your shields, make sure that you're as close to them as you can possibly get. It takes some practice to know where you should be standing exactly. There are some crosses on the floor that are supposed to help you out, but they don't really help you out because you can stand there and then the bullets can still go past your shield. Just try to hug the JTF officer, so to speak, and then pop your shield out in the direction of the minigun. But yeah, it's gonna take practice. And this is also why it's easier to bring a few high skill power builds to this last part of the mission. Because if you have a high skill power shield, you're going to have more time to prepare and get in position. Because even if the turret shoots at you before you have to defend the JTF soldier, it won't matter too much. Because uh, the shield will have enough HP to survive anyway. However, you're not going to have that same luxury with a low skill power shield. Because you're going to have to sweep in between the JTF and the minigun last second. And then quickly pop the shield out to make sure that the shield is still at full HP when the turret starts to target it. And if you want to do that, well then you kind of have to know where to stand. You need to have some experience under the belt. That is why a dedicated shield build would be nice to have if you're doing this for the first time. But it's not required. Again, not a requirement. Look at this, for example. Even when you have no skill power whatsoever, when you just refuse to switch to a high skill power build or when you just don't have it in your inventory, well, then defending the JTF is still more than possible. But in cases like this, players will simply be required to pop a survivor link and then also pop a medkit with the combat medic talent to heal up the shield as it is getting targeted. Because uh, the survivor link, the all damage resilience, is also going to be applied to the shield. And then if you pop a medkit, it's also going to heal the shield if you have combat medic enabled. This is most likely also how you're going to have to do things in patch 1.8 if the nerfs to the shield persist. And if you don't have a dedicated defense player. So just keep that in mind. But anyway, that's a whole lot of talk about defending the JTF guy with the shield. It's something that should be very simple. I hope this helped out. But anyway, after defending the first JTF and keeping him alive from that damage, a button prompt will spawn on the front left side of the map, which after pressed will blow up the minigun and then spawn the first named boss. The button takes a little while to press though, and the minigun will try to kill anyone pressing the button. So make sure that you have the Reclaimer Shield player ready to block all of the bullets from the guy that's pressing the button. If you do it properly, look something like this. The minigun's gonna blow up, boss is gonna spawn. Now the moment the boss spawns, there are two ways to go about it. If you're new to the mission, if it's your first time or your first couple of times, I recommend that you kill every NPC first before killing the boss. This is because the NPCs here are not infinite and the mission only continues to progress after you kill the boss. So if you kill the boss and the mission progresses and all of the NPCs are still alive, it's going to be a lot more difficult than when you already killed them. Makes sense, right? Because yeah, basically what happens if you kill the boss, then another boss will spawn, he will go on the minigun, he will reactivate it, and then that boss is going to try to kill more JTF soldiers. There's still some time in between the first boss dying and the second boss reactivating the minigun, uh, so if you're experienced enough, you can burst the boss down, then kill every NPC in the downtime, but again, if it's your first run, you might want to take things a bit slower and kill the boss last. There's also one more thing to keep in mind when killing the boss, and that's when the boss is almost dead. When you deplete his armor bar, a heavy will spawn all the way at the back of the room, coming uh, from upstairs, he will jump down and he will try to flank everybody. You want to be on the lookout for this. If you want to play it safe, you could shoot the boss down until the armor is gone, then you can kill the heavy that spawns, and then after that, you can finally kill the boss when no other NPC is around. And as I said, after the boss is dead, the game will continue. A second boss will spawn in, jump on the minigun, try to kill more JTF officers, and this time you're gonna have to defend two instead of one. This is why we need more than one player with the shield. From this moment on, it's rinse and repeat. JTF saved? Great. Go to the right side of the room, press that button, blow up the turret, boss will spawn, kill the NPCs, kill the heavy in the back, kill the boss, and then the last round of defending the JTF officers begins. This time you're going to have to defend all three JTF soldiers. There's one thing that you could take in mind, and that is that in the current version of the game, you don't actually have to defend the JTF officer in the back in this very last stage of the mission. Uh, because for some reason he just doesn't take damage even when no one is defending him. 
But seeing as how I mentioned it in this video now, uh, a developer is probably going to watch this video at some point. They might fix this before patch 1.8. So it's best that everybody preparing for 1.8 and practicing this mission gets in the habit of defending this guy anyway, just in case that they actually do fix it before 1.8 drops. Now the moment all three JTF officers are safe, run to the middle of the map to this button, have someone defend it with the shield, again, preferably the high skill power player, and then have another guy press the button and blow up the minigun one last time, spawning one final boss for you to kill. In this boss wave, you're going to have infinitely spawning heavies, snipers, shotgunners, and grenadiers, but you're also going to have to take on Bobcat. Now, what makes Bobcat so special? What makes him such a special boy? Well, let me tell you, this Bobcat has a special ability that temporarily gives him 99% all damage resilience, making him practically unkillable. And when he has this up, it also allows him to kill anybody with just one bullet as soon as he sees you. No, guys, this is not a joke. This is actually what this boss does on heroic difficulty. He is unkillable and he kills you in one bullet. This only happens when he has his ability up, though. You can recognize when he's going to use this ability when he switches weapons. And when he's in the god state, he will have a blue overlay on top of his body and also a timer above his head indicating for how long this god state will last. During this period, I simply recommend avoiding line of sight. Don't even shoot a single bullet at him. Basically pretend he doesn't exist, but don't get too close to him because then you're dead. If you are really coordinated with your squad, you could wait in the back of the room just after he spawns in and then wait for him to walk up closer to you. Then have one player throw a stun grenade underneath him. So he's going to be stunned, locked in that stun animation. And then as you probably guessed it, have one teammate pop a tech link and have all four players try to burst him down. He's really tanky, but if you're quick enough and if you have the damage, it is possible to kill him before he activates his ability just once. So you're basically skipping the whole gob mode mechanic of this mission and that easily shaves off five minutes of your run per run. But if you're inexperienced, then I don't recommend trying this out because when you fail, well, he's gonna go gob mode and he's gonna be at point blank range and will instantly kill the whole squad, causing you to, well, wipe and then restart the entire last room, which is, it's painful, not gonna lie, it's, it's pretty painful. Anyway, after you're taken down, you have to clear up the remaining NPCs and then you can finally take a breath again because you did it. You completed stolen signal, uh, just free up the JTF officers and you're good to go. Piece of cake, right? You did that all in what? 15, 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes if you're on console. Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be around that time if you're fast. It's not going to be five minutes like Clear Sky. I mean, it's a tutorial video, guys, not magic. And chances are, let's be honest here, if you haven't done this mission before yet, you're going to be spending a good amount of hours practicing each room before having clean runs like this. Uh, this is a how-to with every possible tip and trick that I can think of to make your life easier. It is still going to be up to you and your squad to execute. I know I can say a million things, but I also know that some of you guys learn best by just watching some raw gameplay instead of this heavily edited pile of shit that maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense in some areas. So what I've also done is left you with some raw gameplay in the description box down below of me and my squad basically running through this mission the way that it's intended, the way that I describe here in this video. It isn't the cleanest run, you know, some members go down a few times, but that's the point, right? To show you some unfiltered gameplay, which may clear up some things that for some reason this video might not have done. I don't know. I tried to cover everything. Not sure if I did. Not sure if everything was clear. But yeah, that's going to be all for me today, though. If you have any tips, tricks, or maybe some questions left, well, you pretty much know where to find me. But if not, then, uh, well, as always, guys, I will see you guys later. Or, like they say, in the Netherlands. See you later.